This is a really exciting episode of Funding Awesome. Most people think that Nvidia only builds AI chips for data centers and PCs, but let me show you a different application altogether. While I was at Nvidia GTC, I had the privilege of interviewing Danny Shapiro, Nvidia's Vice President of Automotive. I used that time to learn as much as I can about Nvidia's self-driving programs, including the sensors they support for all kinds of autonomous vehicles, the supercomputers that they put in every single one, how Nvidia uses generative AI and simulation to enhance the self-driving experience, and all the crazy capabilities that the Omniverse is unlocking for the entire auto industry. Your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. I'm Danny Shapiro, Vice President of Automotive at NVIDIA, and we're here live at GTC. I'm excited to be here with you. So this is the Polestar 3. It's powered by NVIDIA, so the new NVIDIA Drive platform. We have LiDAR, which is a laser scanner, cameras, radar, ultrasonics. All these sensors are generating a massive amount of data yeah. that goes in the brain. We have to make sense of it then. What's a car? What's a bike? What's a truck? Where are the lane lines? Sure. The lights? Anything out there needs to be decipher. So this is where artificial intelligence comes in. We take that okay. signal data and understand what you and I recognize as a person. Artificial intelligence has to scan through all the pixels in a frame of video yeah. to figure out where a person is in the scene. In this case, it's automated driving. There's going to be driver behind the wheel still. So still a driver, yep. Still a driver. But the brain of the car is so powerful that we can update the software over time and we'll add new features and new capabilities and different kinds of autonomous modes throughout the life of the vehicle. Well, let's start from the top, right? So LiDAR, light detection and ranging. That's that sensor up there, right? That's right. Is there just one LiDAR or how many LiDARs? Yeah, so there there, in some vehicles, and we, we can look at some of the other robo-taxis and robo-buses, have multiple LiDAR. In this case, there's one in the center of the car, so it's front facing. Yep. Sometimes there's one on the rear. There could be LiDAR also on the sides. But we have a combination of surround cameras surround radar and together they help us form a 360 degree picture of what's going on around the car. Sure. Okay, so where where are the cameras? Can I like... Yeah. Uh... So cameras are also going to be right there okay. behind the mirror. Um, so often there'll be cameras in the side mirrors. Yep. Rear facing cameras oh, cool. as well. So I'll, we'll, we'll Radar get a... is always hidden kind of behind the fascia. You can't see it. And the ultrasonic you've probably seen on cars, those little dots around the bumpers. So that gives you short range coverage for okay, parking so scenarios. Ultrasonic is for short range. Why have a LiDAR and a radar? What's the difference so between it, those? It's really, a, it's a really good question. They have their different strengths and weaknesses in terms of distance, in terms of range, in terms of resolution. It's like a camera, you need light, right? Totally. Whereas so, the radar and LiDAR can see in the dark. And so it's the combination it. of these different kinds of sensors that give greater levels of safety and security. Got it. I have a quick question about like fog. So fog occludes you from using cameras. Does the radar work well in fog? The LiDAR, yeah, how yeah, do you get so, fog? So that's part of different weather affects different sensors. But again, by combining and fusing these different signals together, you get a more robust picture in a variety of conditions. Cool, so all of those sensors go to a brain. Is that brain like a chip in the car? Is it in the cloud? Where's that brain? That brain absolutely is in the car. And that's our NVIDIA Drive platform. So this is a supercomputer designed for automotive applications. Whoa. It has to be automotive grade. So it's not like the GPU that goes in your PC. Okay. It has to operate at any temperature in the coldest winter temperatures Whoa. to the heat, you know, driving through the desert. You know, if you leave your, your phone in a car on a summer day, it'll overheat. It won't work. Totally. Our drive computer and basically any circuitry in a vehicle needs to be automotive grade and adhere to these wide temperature ranges. Sure. The additional shock and vibration of being in a car, dust. So the harsh conditions are things that we then develop the chips to be able to sustain themselves. In. So harsh conditions is just one of the challenges, right? Another challenge, what about when you don't have a lot of cell service or internet connectivity? Does it do everything in the car? Or does it talk to the cloud? How does that work? So I think requiring connectivity is kind of a misconception about autonomy. Okay. You don't need connectivity to drive. The connectivity is one way you can get software updates when the car's in your garage. Whoa, okay. You can stream, you know, Spotify. Um, yeah. If you want to do a search of a restaurant or something, that'll go to the cloud. Your navigation often streams based on your GPS. Got it. But for the autonomy, that decision making has to happen on board. It's too mission critical. The amount of time to make the decisions is too short to go to the cloud, do some computation and come back. So all that sensor data feeds straight into the car computer 
And basically we have a one thirtieth of a second, so like one frame of video Whoa. to be able to identify everything in that scene and then make those driving decisions. How are you able to make those decisions so fast? Is it like some specialized algorithm? What's going on at the software level to be able to do things so fast? Another really good question. That is where artificial intelligence comes in. Okay. Like the world is too complex to be able to write code to say, if you see this, then you do that. Else, if you yeah. see this other thing, you, I mean, there's too yeah. many things that could happen. There's sure. too much in a scene. So rules-based doesn't work. Correct. Okay. So AI, we can train how to recognize all different types of objects and scenarios. And so in a fraction of a second, with a powerful supercomputer, we're able to understand that full environment. It almost starts to look like a video game inside the brain of the car, right? We're Whoa. creating a digital twin of the real world inside the brain. We know our car is here. And then we can decide, do we accelerate, brake, turn left or turn right sure. based on everything around. So there's a literal AI supercomputer somewhere inside this vehicle. That's right. Connecting everything together and making decisions way faster than a human can, right? And not only way faster, but it can see way more of the car. We kind of have stereoscopic vision. We see in a cone in front of us. We don't know what's going on in the sides. And when we look to our side mirrors, you know, we're changing our field of view. This thing has sensors everywhere. Some of that computation is just because it's seeing so much more. Absolutely. Not just visual, but lasers, radio waves, yeah, sonar. They're, they're keeping, you're absolutely right, 360 degree perception. Yeah. Doesn't get distracted, doesn't get drowsy. Yeah. And um, yeah, just constantly monitoring. The other thing is the level of precision is so much greater than you or I because it knows Whoa. the precise the distance. What's our speed? What's the closing speed of the car in front of it? To be able to apply the right amount of brake to avoid a collision. That's actually a really great point. I'm actually terrible at estimating distance, right? So even though I can see in 3D, because we have you have special sensors that are just dedicated to range finding. So in what we're focusing on here is AI sensing outside the car. We've announced our new Blackwell processors. Yeah. That's our next generation GPU. That will go into Drive4, our next generation okay. of car computer. And that's going to enable generative AI applications inside the car. So an AI cockpit now where you can have a conversation with the car. Whoa. It will know everything about your car. It will get to know you, right, and your preferences. What would I talk to my car about? Can you give me a few examples? Well, you could control every aspect of the vehicle with your voice. Um, there may be diagnostics that it's running or it can understand if there's a certain vibration, there may be an issue and it can identify it and communicate it yeah. with you. I need oil. Back to the factory. Hey, I'm getting low on gas. Hey, I have a tire with low pressure. Are those the kind of things like it will say it, to us? Or it, like it certainly could be, but you can maybe even control other aspects of the car. Um, and then this is where the cloud comes in too. You can make requests to the car and if it needs to go outside to get, you know, What's time is a movie going to start? Or what's the weather in your destination or anything like oh. that? Then it'll be this hybrid approach where That's it goes cool. to fetch data from other services. So it's almost like a generative AI agent that Absolutely. A, understands the car, but B, understands you enough to say, hey, I want to go see a movie. And it'll be like, hey, I'm routing you to the nearest theater where you know the movie is playing closest to the time it is now or whatever the right answer right. is. So it's able to do relevant work for you as you drive, not just related to the car itself is That's what I'm right. trying to get at. That's super interesting. Is there, so what's the interface for that look like? Is it a screen in there? Is it just voice to text and text to voice? How do people interface yeah. with the uh, car AI? So we've developed a technology called ACE, which is our avatar ACE. cloud engine. Okay. And so this is a way to have um, different kinds of avatars, a concierge in your car. It can be personalized. And we have a number of technologies that take text to speech, speech to text, so there's a lot of different interfaces, but also we can animate based on spoken language of that okay. avatar. So it's, it's automatic animation. We'll be able to see the thing that we're talking to, so it has, it's a little embodied even though it's virtual. That's cool. We think of autonomy in sort of five levels, right? Where the difference between level two and three is pretty crucial because level two, the driver is still responsible. Level three, you start shifting the responsibility to the car. What level is this? So when these cars initially come out, they're going to be what we call level two plus. Level two. So they're very advanced, okay. but the driver still has to be in control. The driver is responsible. Yeah. Uh, moving to level three is more of a highway pilot. We're doing that with Mercedes Benz. Sure. Where the CLA concept that's down in the lobby, beautiful vehicle, their next generation will be based on that and beyond. We'll have NVIDIA drive inside. 
And so when those tires come out, they can get software updates that will add higher levels of autonomy to the vehicle. So drive is slowly moving up those levels over time. Is that like, exactly. it's gonna be the same platform currently at level two that crosses into level three? Exactly. Um, can you speak to the differences between level two and level two plus? Can you help me yeah, understand so, that? So level two plus has um, usually a lot more sensors on the car. Okay. And it's really enabling it to get to that next level without having to do anything other than the software. Oh. Traditional level two is more just driver assistance, emergency braking, um, maybe you know, blind spot, but usually not lane keeping and things like that. So when we start to merge adaptive cruise control and lane keeping, now what we're doing is getting it robust enough that we can take the driver out of the loop and know that the car is going Whoa. to do what it needs to do. So, so we'll probably see a yeah. highway pilot first. It's a you know, smaller set of things to worry about, but then beyond that, move to an urban pilot where you'd have more pedestrians. And, and when like you that. say a highway pilot, so that's after a certain speed, is it on only certain specific highways or is it more of a function of, hey, we recognize you're on a big road going fast you're, now you can enable this feature. How does a highway pilot work? It really varies by automaker. Okay. Right? They can have different uh, interfaces and different conditions that need to be met. But what we see is in general, being on a single direction road with controlled you know, exits and, and, yeah. and on ramps and off ramps, uh, multiple lanes, the driver sets their destination and the car will just drive. And it will stay in the lanes. It can maybe overtake other vehicles if they're going slower and can even you know go off of one freeway onto another freeway. Whoa. The urban pilot then is much more complex because it's dealing with stop signs, stop lights, yeah. intersections, sure. pedestrians, and, and a lot of congestion. But we're doing a lot of trials and pilots right now with a number of different companies. We have over a hundred different automakers, truck makers, robo taxi companies, uh, shuttle companies that are developing on NVIDIA Drive oh, yeah. and have a whole range of different pilots. So on the show floor here, we have the Volvo EX90, another beautiful vehicle that will have NVIDIA Drive. It's coming out this summer. That's cool. So we ride RoboBus is behind us. This is a, uh, a fully autonomous bus that is operating in Beijing, in Singapore, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, Neuro is another customer. They have their uh, last mile delivery robot. Okay. So you can order things from the grocery store or pizza, and this autonomous vehicle will drive on the roads and deliver your your goods. And all of these different vehicles will have supercomputers in them that can one day reach level three autonomy? Is that like the right and way to think And in some cases, level four. Can you explain quickly the difference between level three and level four? Well, a level four device doesn't need to have a steering wheel or a gas pedal. So you don't so, even get human intervention that's in right. that one. Okay. That's right. So one of the questions I have, this is from a few GTCs ago, Jensen was talking about mapping large road networks. That was a big effort. Mm -hmm. Do you need those digital maps? Does this rely on digital twins? Like, is that part so, of this framework? Or really not? good question. So digital twins are something that we're using throughout the entire auto industry. Okay. So let's just talk about even designing cars. NVIDIA Omniverse is our platform for digital twins. Yes. Yeah. They can create a digital twin of the car, modify it, put it into a virtual wind tunnel simulation. Okay. And be able to determine what's the coefficient of drag. Right? What's the fuel economy going to be of this car? And they can make these modifications to the design and then see how that affects. The wow, outcome. yeah, without ever manufacturing anything physical. No, no clay models, Whoa. anything. So it really streamlines the process. Then you can also do virtual crash test simulations and see structurally how safe is the vehicle. Without wrecking a physical car. That's right. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what we can do is create a digital twin of the factory and really build out how does the assembly line work, the robots ring. How do they interact, making sure those robots don't collide, that there's enough space in the factory for everything to move, material handling. So this is a massive win for the auto industry. Sure. They can do factory planning, again, in the cloud, in Omniverse, before they actually break ground on the real factory. So they save a massive amount of money by not having to do change orders, yeah. rebuild stuff. It might be, oh my God, we didn't make the ceiling high enough because the arm of oh the robot gosh, yeah. has, you know, so whatever it is, yeah. it's a really great tool. And then we can even take that simulation into the development of autonomous vehicles. So we create a digital twin of a city and we put all these vehicles in there and we can test how they operate. Oh, and wow. Are they going to detect the children running across in Based front of the Based on the bus? actual sensors that are going exactly. in the car, that you know the resolutions, you know. That's we, incredible. We simulate everything. We simulate all these sensors. So we actually take our NVIDIA Drive brain and we put that in a server 
and then we have a different server that's creating synthetic data, all the radar, LIDAR, cameras, as if it was driving on the road. So our drive computer thinks it's on the road driving around. It's getting these signals as if Whoa. it was driving. And so it's making the driving decisions, turning you know, left yeah. to right, braking, accelerating. And then so we can test it fully before we actually put it in a real vehicle on the road. Yeah. And you mentioned at the start of this conversation, you know, the types of things that the automotive ha industry has to do, you know, highly regulated, it has to adhere to a different standard than say a traditional GPU. What about the simulation data? Does the simulation data have to adhere to a certain standard so that they know that you're modeling sensors with a certain accuracy, that when you're training something in a virtual environment, it's good enough to be right. put in a physical so, environment? So that's exactly what we do is, is Omniverse is physically active. So we work with all the sensor makers to model the characteristics exactly of their sensors. So those things basically we know are accurate. Yeah, and materials and that's yeah. right. And so it's a combination, we still do real world testing. Yeah, sure. But it's a combination of the real world plus the simulation where in simulation we have ultimate control over the time of day, the lighting, the weather, all these things. So we can repeat tests that you couldn't really repeat in the real world. So if there's an issue we're trying to solve, we can then continually hammer on it. Sure. We can drive at sunset all day long in simulation. Whereas if you're trying to test what do the sensors do at yeah. sunset, you only get a couple minutes a day. That's right. So you're getting real edge cases that you can say, hey, they don't have to be edge in a virtual. Right. You know, we can repeat this. That's really interesting. That's a great point. Behind us is the neuro, and you can see on top is the LiDAR sensor there. Yeah. So this is a, a, a delivery bot. There's, there's no driver inside. Um, you can see on the side here the interface to how people would uh, you know, order something, it could be groceries, could be pizza, pizza yeah. and it gets delivered. Uh, and then with their cell phone uh, app, they're able to unlock compartments and take out their order. Um, they also have set up a shop here. It looks like it's doing very well, it's selling out, but they have cameras. <laughs> There's cameras that can track what's been removed yeah. from the vehicle and then would be automatically charged to your account. This is awesome. You and each- Step right up. Sure. Right, Let's do it. Blue so, blue button at the bottom. Okay, so you can imagine you just uh, got your order and I was about to leave. Okay. Uh, and then we'll show you the other one, which was it just pulls up to your home. It would text you a code to say, enter this code, it'll open the vehicle. Okay. So you would tap the screen uh, and then do like one, two, three, five. Uh, and then open. That is super cool. That's awesome. And so, what am I taking now? Do I get a full pizza? Uh, if you're really well, why don't you start with a snack and a poster? Did you say there's a poster? Oh, dude, these are cool. Can I grab one of each? Yeah. I'm greedy. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Massive, huge convention. We're standing behind like a huge Blackwell rack right now. But Blackwell is also inside all of the vehicles we just talked about. That's right. Can Blackwell is our newest GPU architecture. Yeah. It's a platform from a single GPU to a rack, but that same technology is what's going into NVIDIA Drive Thor, our next generation processor, that's going to be able to enable autonomous vehicles, autonomous trucks, robo yeah. taxis and shuttles. And so what is the difference between Thor and Drive? How do so we think Thor about that? Thor is the SOC, the system on a chip that goes inside the whole Drive platform. Those ECUs along the wall are yeah. all drive platforms from different partners, from Lenovo, from WeRide, from Zeker. They're using the technology here from the data center into that SOC, and then the whole platform has all the connectors for the LiDAR, the radar, the yeah. cameras to plug in. Yeah, so yeah, we've come full circle. I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for walking us through all the different levels that go into level two autonomy today, level two plus, and then soon, level three a time, right? Absolutely. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. A huge thank you to Danny Shapiro for walking us through NVIDIA's drive platform, the AI chips that power it, the sensors that it supports, and how NVIDIA is combining real world and simulated data to help the entire auto industry achieve autonomy. There's a lot more to NVIDIA than data centers and PCs. So another big thank you to them for inviting me to GTC to learn everything I can in person and share it with all of you. And of course, thank you for watching and for supporting the channel. Until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make
is in you.